Hello, everybody, and welcome to Norway, 1945 to today. This is a period of great change in Norway, and one that is of great interest to cruise passengers. And you will get asked about Norway uh, in this period uh, very frequently, particularly about oil money. And we're going to talk about that at the end of today's lesson. Let's look at Norway after World War II, though, to begin. This period in Norwegian history is also known as the Etterkrigstia, or the After War Time. It lasts from 1945 until the middle of the 1950s, really. Um, clear into the middle of the 1950s, there's rationing for some consumer goods here in Norway. Uh, the very difficult, most difficult part of the economic downturn after the war is over by 1949, but there are still problems clear up into the middle part of the 50s. Well, let's look at the economic problems. Um, first of all, the, econo the economy of Norway had been returned to the level that it was in in 1930. It, it, uh, it fell back 15 years, and largely because of the 140,000 Norwegians who were suddenly unemployed when the Germans lost the war because 140,000 people had been employed building and construction constructing German projects all over Norway. Uh, here in Kristiansand, Battery Vaga, where the Kristiansand Kanon Museum uh, was the largest employer in Kristiansand for four years, from 1940 to 1944. Out at Lista, where the Lista Lighthouse is, the Germans had built a huge airfield, and they had also... Um, built a fort, Nordberg Fort in Lista. Erlana Air Base, which is across the Trondheim Fjord from, from Trondheim, uh, built during the war. The Nordlandsbanen in, up in uh, Finnmark is finished. So there were a lot of projects going on that employed a lot of people. And when that goes away, 140,000 people are unemployed. Also, the Germans had withdrawn 1.1 billion kroner from the National Bank of Norway to, in part, finance all of these projects. So that money is gone, and the jobs are gone. So the economy is set back at least 15 years to the level of about 1939, 1940. I'm sorry, 1930. So... The Germans had left behind a very mixed bag. They left behind a, a legacy of destruction and construction. Let's look at the destruction first. In Finnmark, as the German forces withdrew and moved south, they practiced a policy called scorched earth, which meant that they would leave nothing behind them of use to a possible invading Russian force. And this is called scorched earth. So they burn down everything in the Finnmark. Uh, for example, uh, they're rebuilding Hunningsvog. This is right after the war. So Hunningsvog had to be completely rebuilt. So there's huge destruction in northern Norway. But there's a weird mix in that the infrastructure in Norway had been improved during the war, and particularly the transport infrastructure. Railroads had been built. The Nurlandsbane was finished from Trondheim to Moirana. The Sirlandsbane here in, in Sirlana had been finished. The last stretch between Moy and, and Flekkefjord was finished during the war. Highways had been built. The E6 is finished across the northernmost Fulke. Airfields and air bases had been built all over Norway, Vanus in Trondheim, Sola in Stavanger. Uh, Gardamon had been expanded uh, during the war. Shavik here in Kristiansand had been expanded from a private airfield to a military uh, observation airplane airfield. And in fact, the, the, uh, the uh, landing the strip that you land on today dates from the wartime. It's been expanded since then, but the engineering that was done there was done during the war. So there's 
an improved infrastructure, transport infrastructure, but a tremendous amount of destruction far up in the north. Also, at the end of the war, international trade is absolutely at a standstill, not just here, but all over Europe. You can see here that in 1938 to 1950, there's almost a flat line in international trade. And then after 1950, it really starts to take off. And that's going to affect the Norwegian economy. Uh, Norway, in an attempt to be involved in the world and to get over the effects of World War II and to see that it never happens again, becomes a charter member of the United Nations. A charter member means that they're a founding member. Uh, June 26, 1945, the Norwegian ambassador, Morgenstana, signs the UN founding document, the charter. And Norway is one of the original 50 signatories to the United Nations. Well, the United States in 1947 created a plan to help the economies of Europe get started again. The economies, there were people literally starving to death in Germany and France after the war, and the economies there are in, in a wreck. So in 1947, a, a, an American general who is named George Marshall begins this program, uh, the, the Marshall Plan. And that's his picture there on the right. His name was George C. Marshall, and his plan was to invest $13 billion in the European economies. Now, most of that money went to England and France, and to West Germany. But Norway got some money. However, Norway remained quite skeptical of accepting money from a third power. Um, they had had a lot of experience with being dominated by foreign powers, so they did not take so much money. They did take some military and industrial equipment. This is a great photo. This is from Battery Vaga, immediately after the war. Um... They're using a German rangefinder, and they're wearing British. These are Norwegian troops. They're wearing English uniforms and a mix of German helmets and, and English helmets. Um, so they used materials and industrial equipment provided by the Marshall Plan, but not so much. But the Marshall Plan does have the huge advantage that it restarts the Nor the European economies. And when trade picks up, then Norway starts to trade again. And by 1949, the Norwegian merchant fleet is larger than it had been in 1939. So we start to see the worst effects of the war are starting to go down by 1949. Housing, however, is going to remain a problem in Norway, particularly in the Finnmark. Um, here in uh, Oslo, we see the, fo the first uh, housing developments, first apartment complexes built. This is 1954 in Oslo. We've already seen the rebuilding done in Hunningsvog and across the Finnmark. Uh, this is Namzos. I always use Namzos as an example because I live there. And also because it has the distinction of being the most destroyed city in World War II. Uh, on April 20th, 1940, the Germans had bombed Namzos and destroyed literally every building in the town, in the city center. Uh, all that was left were stovepipes. But by 1954, Namzos has rebuilt a great deal. So we're rolling in now into the 1950s. The 1950s in Norway are also known, uh, well, we'll get to that in a second, the economy by 53, as the European economies re, re, uh, restart, uh, Norwegian trade picks up because Norway still has all of its raw materials. It's also got all of its hydroelectricity. It's got everything it had before the war, and it just needed a place and, and markets to sell those things. And that's going to start again. This is known here in Norway as the Neusemhetens period or the Frenzy period, the same period in Germany, was called the Wirtschaftswunder, the economic wonder, the economic miracle. Um, 
the world needed a lot of consumer goods after the war. It needed cars and trucks and tractors and infrastructure. And the European economies developed very quickly to supply those things. And a lot of the raw materials for those things came from Norway. However, the Norwegians developed their economy in a very different way from, say, well, West Germany. Here we have a very mixed economy. Uh, it's a mix of capitalism, socialism, and straight-up communism because Norwegians had had their terrible experience with right-wing ideology during World War II, and they moved very far to the left ideologically. Um, as you can see from the sign there, the, the, the country needs to be built or shall be built, but people have to be secure. So that was a very big focus of the 50s, rebuilding the economy, but not at the cost of human insecurity. So the economy booms in the 50s, and by the 1960s, uh, we start to see some really big changes. This is one that all the tourists ask about. They're all always very interested in Norwegian cars. Um, I always use this as an example of that. By 1963, Norway was uh, prosperous enough. They could allow privately owned autos for the first time after the war. Prior to 1963, you had to get special allowance, special permission to own a private car. But by 63, the economy had recovered and they allowed people to purchase their own cars for the first time. This is uh, in Norwegian called the Optimismens Tior, the decade of optimism. And they had reason to be optimistic. Because already in 62, there was talk about oil. Oil, it was beginning in the late 50s and early 60s, Dutch uh, Petroleum Company, Dutch Shell, had done some exploring on the continental shelf off the coast of Holland and then in the North Sea. And they had reason to believe that there were large oil fields offshore in the North Sea. And in October of 62, Phillips Petroleum, which is a company from Texas in the United States, they applied for the first time to drill in the North Sea and were granted a license. Now they don't hit anything. These first wells are dry holes. They don't find anything. But in May of 1963, Norway declared sovereignty or ownership of the Norwegian continental shelf, which is an area much greater than the normal 12 mile international waters limit. It extends far out into the North Sea and they claimed that as Norwegian territory because they suspected correctly that there was oil somewhere out there. And in 1969, they discovered Ecofisk. Now look at where Ecofisk is located. That white, the white lines there indicate the uh, continental shelves of the um, uh, in the North Sea, and you can see that the Ecofisk is right in the corner, almost into English territory, but not quite. So that was a stroke of luck that they found Ecofisk where they found it. By 1972, I'm sorry. Uh, Ecofisk is founded in 19 is found in 1969. The drilling begins and it starts to produce oil in 1971. It took a couple of years for production to actually begin, and that initial production was carried out by foreign companies: Phillips, Shell, British Petroleum, uh, American, Dutch, and uh, English companies. In 1972, though, the Norwegians founded Stat Oil which was an administrative arm that was allowed to collect 50% of the licenses granted to foreign producers, meaning that for every liter pumped out of the ground, a certain amount of that money, of that oil, would be given, not given, but claimed by the um, Norwegian state. So they allow private drilling, but they're going to get a certain amount of every liter that is pumped out of the ground. 
beginning in 1973, there's a series of legislation in the Storting that establishes something called the Ulia Fund. It takes about 10 years for all this legislation to go through. And it's a fund, it's a pot of money, where all of this money from the oil that's produced in the North Sea is uh, collected. And this is ad administered by Norga's bank. So it's used to store, invest, and administer the, va uh, the vast amount of money that's being created through this oil revenue. Uh, today, the Ulia Fund has more than 8 trillion kroner. That's 8 million billion kroner in the fund. They own, they own properties in 72 different countries. They own over 9,000 businesses. They own 1.4% of the world's traded securities. They own 2.4% of Europe's traded securities. So this has been a huge success and has generated an enormous amount of money. And that enormous amount of money has led to something that some people call the curling generation. There is a certain amount of tension in Norwegian society between those born before 1969 and those born after 1969. Those born after 1969 sometimes are referred to as the curling generation. The generation of people who had the way in front of them swept clear, just as you do in curling. You sweep the ice in front of that, that puck that she's going to shoot out there. You, you clear away all the obstacles that, that stop it from meeting your goals or meeting a person's goals. And in particular, the oil money was used to fund um, social programs here in Norway. The Bonnehaga, the health care, retirement, education, care for the elderly. These are all issues in other Western societies that are very difficult, that they all struggle with, that do not get struggled with here in Norway. These are simply not part of a problem for, for Norwegian society. The, Ol the Olia Fund, the money invested into these programs, comes from the Olia Fund and allows all of these programs to exist. And they help clear the way for people to become who they're going to become. It's not all wonderful. If you clear the way for two generations now of people, sometimes you might have to stop and ask yourself, who are we? Just as they asked themselves, as Norwegians asked themselves after 350 years of Danish domination in 1814. And then the entire 19th century is, is dedicated to the, to the question of who are we? Now we're independent, we're still ruled by Sweden, but we're independent. And that's what national romanticism is all about. We've talked about that before. Then we have the, the huge buildup to World War I. And Norway is very prosperous and all that gets wiped out. We have this terrible interwar period of up and down economies, and and uh, and then in 1939 and in 1940, the the nation is invaded by Germany and dominated in a in a very brutal way for five years. And at the end of the war, we have to say, who are we now after this terrible experience? And we answer that by by moving law far far to the left and becoming a mixed economy. And then in 1969, all this enormous amount of, of oil money begins to flow into the society. And it leads, I think, to, a, a, to a, once again a question. Uh, what does it mean to be? What is typical Norwegian? Uh, is it boat bil bunad? Hutte o huse? Uh, is that what everyone is most concerned about? I don't know exactly the answer to this question but i will tell you this and, and i've lived in i've lived in the united states for a long time i worked in in latin america uh, i lived in germany a long time uh, so i've had quite a little experience with people from all over the world and i have never met a group of people who were so 
Optat, who were so interested in Gua Gomeldaga. Is that us? Is that who Norwegians are today? It's, um, it is an interesting question, and I think the central question to Norwegian history, certainly for the last 50 years, um, and part of the fascination here of the Gua Gomeldaga is to answer this question, who are we? And where did we come from? And where are we going? All right. On that note, that's enough for today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <music>